as competing so much as walking into a situation in which men dominate and not with any negative feelings toward us. It's not as though men don't want women to be full partners, but the status quo is one in which men tend to dominate in business and government, uh, in, in every field, in IT, everything basically. And they are there basically by inherited right. So what we're trying to do is upset a balance that has been working very well for men, but hasn't been working well for women. And when you're trying to change a balance, then um, th th there's a challenge in that. Because first of all, we have to convince uh, the, the power structure that we have something unique and different to contribute. And that in fact, um, any field in which we do make any significant headway will be better for the diverse character it will have once we're there. And until we're there, it's really not a representative structure. All the power structures that uh, exist in Canada aren't really representative of the population. And don't reflect the needs of the population. Ms. Taylor? Oh, I agree with what Elaine said. And I think along the way, you know, when you look at the power structures, you know, there's that quote, uh, crimes of omission are just as horrendous as crimes of commission. And I don't know what is done deliberately, but if you look at uh, a lot of the last uh, provincial election, for example, and you look at the way the media represented the women candidates versus the male candidates, uh, a lot of time the women were posed uh, out in a field or sitting cross-legged on a desk and the men uh, were photographed very stately uh, in front of crowds or books or something, uh, you know, just as officious. And uh, it's intriguing what sort of messages and dynamics those sort of images send out there um, and then are internalized by women as well. And, you know, if you look at that power structure that's out there, and this is such a phenomenally fabulous event, and we're getting uh, younger generations coming in more and more, but we, if you look at the demographic of women who are politically active, we're not doing enough to reach out and get the next generation mm -hmm. involved. And I, I think that's because uh, a lot of young women look out there and see the obstacles and see, you know, 100 years, as Natalie said, we've made some phenomenal changes. But when you look at the glass ceiling, to think it's only cracked. We have so much more to do. Uh, and I think we need to be really taking a critical look at uh, what societal forces are stopping us from moving forward as women. And I think we have to do it as women and, and men together and as well. Ms. Claymont, I was at an event that we were both at. at a, it was an after elections night, after a campaign night event, where everybody was having a few beverages. And you were the only woman politician around the pool table having a beverage with all the boys. <laughs> And, and as I was watching you interact, I saw you interacting very differently than I'm used to interacting personally with you. Mm -hmm. How does it change for you when you have to walk into that kind of environment where you're not in front of the council table or in a formal situation, but you're behind the doors? It, it, it's, it's a completely behind the scenes, one-on-one -on -one or the group dynamic. Is it very, very different for you as a woman? Do you have to act differently when you're in that environment than you would normally? Thank you for that question. It's interesting. First of all, you have to be careful how many beverages you drink. <laughs> <laughs> no, because really, you know that men standing around a pool table having beverages is going gonna, is gonna to create a different uh, impression or perception uh, among the people there and watching. And so, I guess as a woman, you're always that much more careful uh, in terms of how you, how you look, mm -hmm. how you appear. Um, I think women's looks in the political uh, arena are... Uh, much more the focus of attention than mm -hmm. men's looks. The way we dress is always the subject of probably more comments and conversation than uh, than our male colleagues. So Do you think that's more from men or more from other women? Oh, it's yes, it's from uh, from other women and from men too. But mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. But it just it just means that we're always conscious of that or more conscious of that. Um, so yeah, that it it is difficult to do the socializing and to to be careful too in terms of how we appear. So, yeah, it's... Do you feel you have to sort of change the way you speak and be one of the boys in that kind of environment? I can't be one of the boys. I'm not. No. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't uh, attempt to be one of the boys. But, you know, I have, to, I have to be myself and I have to be relaxed. But I'm always, I'm always aware. As a mm -hmm. political candidate, you seem to be more aware of your persona. And that can be, that can be tough. Mm -hmm. And it's tough when you are, as I am a candidate, federal candidate, for so long, too, right? We're waiting for an election. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, I love this pin that I'm wearing for the Ontario Federation of Labour with all the hats. 
think women candidates wear so many hats and I'm not sure how, you know, we talk about wanting more women in politics, but I'm not sure how women with small children or family obligations would be able to do it. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. We don't have the support systems in place, the childcare in place to allow uh, women of those generations who are raising families and we want them at the decision making mm -hmm. tables. I don't know how you know, I don't think we're, we're supporting them enough in those. But in those that's projects. one of my follow-up questions. But first, I want to ask Councillor Wood. Mm -hmm. Councillor Wood, you're in South Stormont, which has a lot of a lot more agriculture. It's not a big city sort of, of area. You have a lot of smaller towns. And it, it's unique. Uh, out of your force, there are, I believe, Deputy Mayor is, is, is Tammy Hart, right. mm -hmm. and yourself as a city councillor. So you, by percentage, for example, South Stormont has a higher percentage of female politicians in office than a city of Cornwall. But in a rural environment, in a different age demographic, I'm sure you have certain attitudes and certain um, differences that you've seen a as a politician. Have, have you noticed a, a certain, have you had to, to do certain things to achieve success as a female politician or felt any stresses that way? I haven't at all felt any stresses, but speaking as a, as a full-time employ employee and a mother of four children, mm -hmm. And I sit on numerous boards. I, I know that had my children been smaller, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been a, a career that I could have mm -hmm. uh, exactly. sought. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the challenges would have been too many, too great. But um, it's a wonderful life. I mean, you, you meet wonderful people. You learn so many different things. And being in a small rural community, you're appreciated a little bit more for what you are able to accomplish. And they look at you directly and say, you know, thank you for doing this or for helping us. They seem you're more um, accessible. And I think uh, the one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one is very important. Do you, do you find that voters, and I'll ask this to everybody, do you, do you find that once you're elected that voters interact with you differently than, than they would your male counterpart? Is there almost like a, a maternal f issue at times? Is there an advantage <laughs> to being an elected female politician? I honestly think you're, you have hit something on the head there. Women seem to be more... Um, nurturing by just by nature and I, I think a lot of people even though male or female they they do seem to find us more approachable than men mm -hmm. now city council we'll talk about municipal po politics most cities or areas we're looking at a part-time position so Bernadette you hit on this a little bit before if you're a single mom or if you're a working mom and you've got a family and a house and a full-time job as, as you do working at the legal clinic, do you think this detracts more for women becoming candidates than men becoming candidates? It's part of it. It's part of it. I mean, women who are sole supporting their families, they have to, that's the main priority. You have to be working. Mm -hmm. And uh, politics, you know, you get paid for what you do, but people have to realize that you put in so much more than, than what your salary, uh, you know, represents. Because when you're a political person, when you're a counselor, you're out there every time you're in the public, you're on, you're communicating constantly. And mm -hmm. it would be hard raising raising young children and having mm -hmm. to support your family. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure we have the support systems in place to encourage that. Do we have to make council positions full time to be able to attract more women and, and, and better or stronger diverse groups of, of candidates? Lane? Well, if we were to make women or, or counselors full-time positions, then we'd certainly have to increase the responsibility that goes with being counselor. Mm -hmm. And you'd probably intrude on, uh, uh, you'd have to take over some management likely, and I don't think that's a function of counselor. So I think part-time um, were adequate. We need a, a large number of us in order to do what needs to be done, but that would just change so much because uh, there aren't 14 full-time jobs around the table. Mm -hmm. There's certainly more than uh, is measured in terms of the, uh, the remuneration we receive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but certainly not a full-time job. My first experience in covering politics was the last federal election, and in our writing we had one female candidate, Darlene Jalbert, and it was interesting to see how she had to deal with the media and how she had to deal with the other politicians at the time. Can some of you talk a little bit about your experience with the media and have you thought of any uh, favoritism or, or handicaps that you've experienced at the hands of the media, locally or otherwise, in, in your careers as politicians? Uh, I just, I think, Jamie, it was an interesting question when you asked Bernadette if she felt that she had to be one of the boys. Um, we had a women's event here today and we had men in the audience. It would have been interesting to put the men on the seat here and ask them if they felt they had to be one of the girls. 
and it'd be interesting. Yes. It'd be interesting to clarify. Like, I'm not sure what one of the guys. It, I know what a male is, but like, what does that mean? And then, what does it mean at a women's event to be one of the girls? Mm -hmm. And I and I think these are the conversations that we have to have because I think we're sitting here because we know the media te treat women differently. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, if you look at elections, in terms of uh, spot time, uh, in terms of who the media will speak to first, um, mm -hmm. who uh, you know who gravitates towards whom, and a lot of it has to do with a network of people who know each other, right? And then you gravitate to what and whom you know. And so I think women uh, maybe who haven't had the luxury of being out on the golf courses all the time or at the pool tables, because you know their other obligations are just sort of trying to swim their way in and you know that that's not us um, trying to say we need some special status that's just us saying you know you have to be conscious of that what does it mean to be one of the guys and what we have guys have said here about being one of the girls mm -hmm. well here today at your event I think there was only one man in the audience that either wasn't um, working essentially at representing their organization or with a spouse so you didn't have a lot of, of men attending this audience. Do you think men are scared off by events like today? I guess you'd have to ask yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Ask yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm fearless. I, I, know, I, I know I'm a man, but I, I've, I've covered a lot of these events. Um, Media-wise, in this town, you have ourselves. I, I own the Cornwall Free News and Seaway Radio, so that's a male owned operation. Mm -hmm. Your head editors of the freeholder of the Seaway News, mm -hmm. the managing director of Chorus Radio, there is no real female driven media other than the Secret Chicks, which is a very tiny mm -hmm. little outlet. Do you think that plays a role in how you're treated in, in the media in, in at all? I'm sure it does. I'm, I'm sure it's just a question of what's on a person's radar screen. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, men and women think differently. They they approach issues differently, mm -hmm. and um, it's just like a, my remarks about Wikipedia being primarily written by men. We tend to accept the fact that opinion in Canada is male. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the, the editorials mm -hmm. in the newspapers, and it's, it's male, male written uh, about male interests. Mm -hmm. No, we, we had a radio show, which um, Ms. Claymont was a guest on last year, called the Vagina Hour was hosted by Marina Restinetti and it was it was about women's issues and we were really trying to create something strong and powerful for women. We actually had one local women's organization say that their members could not support anything that had the term vagina mm -hmm. in the, the name and we have the vagina monologues tonight yeah. which is its second year in a row being sold out and we're one of the media sponsors for that. I think we're the only media sponsor for that event. Mm -hmm. I have to say that I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm in the vagina monologues again for the second year but I think I'd be uncomfortable being on a radio show about the vagina, what did you say it was? It was called the Vagina Hour. The vagina mm -hmm. Hour. I, I can't imagine a man's show being the penis hour. Mm -hmm. So well, I rest my case. I don't think, as much as I am, I'm a firm mm -hmm. advocate of women's rights. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine calling into or appearing on a show called the Vagina Hour, mm -hmm. and it, I even think, though I'm yeah. in the Vagina Monologues. Yeah, and as the director <laughs> well, it was of the a, it was a tribute, yeah. last year, you know, and I think it ties into, when you get back to the media, and having managed several of Elaine's campaigns and you know being involved in a lot of election and sitting and listening, when it comes to edit editorial boards, for example, asking questions, women will always be asked, bang on, first off, they'll be the first ones asked the questions about abortion, <laughs> same-sex marriage, and childcare. The men will get the economic questions and uh, you know the business and international relations questions. And do you know what? I can pull out my notebooks from years past and say, and, it, and it's intriguing that it then just becomes painted as those are again we say this is the domains of women and this is the domains of men. And I'm quite confident that you know our male colleagues can answer the other questions as can we the others. But mm -hmm. you know, and it, then it just becomes you know what becomes the association again, right? And then that separation. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really good when we yeah. we, uh, we have to focus on the trailblazers. I know that's a term that the Immigrant yeah. Services Agency used to mm -hmm. to uh, celebrate the achievements of people within the immigrant community, but within the um, broader Canadian society too, like mm -hmm. sports. You know, we need to see more women being celebrated for their athletic mm -hmm. achievements, and we just have to make our way. And people have to recognize they have to make way for us as mm -hmm. well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, go ahead. oh, I was just going to, I always uh, enjoy hearing Elaine and Laurie talk about the media, women in the media. 
Uh, and I enjoyed being interviewed by Marina, by the way. She's, mm -hmm. uh, she's quite, quite a, a skilled uh, mm -hmm. interviewer, and it was a fun interview. Um, but, you know, it, it has been, I, I know when I was first elected to City Council, I, I found that I would have to fight more for quotes in the newspaper or mm -hmm. for airtime. Um, not fight more, but sort of stand up and, and take mm -hmm. your place a bit more. And then as you get more political experience and more political exposure, you know, you, you, you have to, as a woman candidate, build your own relationships mm -hmm. with the media. And um, I think you have to fight a little harder for airtime. Mm -hmm. And once you do, then the media, you know, once the media get used to seeing your voice and the public gets used mm -hmm. to seeing your voice, they go to you. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. well, she's had a few good things mm -hmm. to say. We'll go to her. But it is, it is harder at first. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting that you say that because we gave you a lot of early media coverage. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about no, media I, I, coverage in general. I said I'm going to juxtapose that. Yeah. I also gave a lot of media coverage to Mr. Thomas Mulcair, MP for in, in Quebec. Right. Mm -hmm. When I gave you a lot of media coverage, I was teased and chastised as having a flirtation. Whereas, oh, really? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But with Mr. Mulcair, no one suggested that I had a flirtation with him. So people accused you of that? Yes, oh, because I gave you exposure as, as, as a candidate, which I thought was really, really odd and, and again, very sexist. And, and, there's, <laughs> and it was women. Really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. sexism cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. I'm glad mm -hmm. that we could talk about it. I won't keep you guys too much longer. Uh, Councillor Woods, I'm going to start this question with you. Younger women in politics, younger people in politics in general. You don't see a lot of younger people at all um, getting involved in politics as as a norm. There's a younger meaning. Well, 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 for instance, you've got Count, uh, Mayor Duncan, who's 22, mm -hmm. but you don't see a lot of younger candidates. I mean, in the last uh, municipal election in Cornwall, I think the average age was over 40 for for councillor, if not older, closer to 50. There were there were some young candidates, but they didn't get a lot of success when it came to the voter turnout and result. And there was a lower turnout in general. We have an issue of younger people voting to start with, and the people we're voting for tend to be older. Mm -hmm. How do you attract younger women one into the political sphere, and how do you find the people who are going to follow after your footsteps as a city councillor or as a, as a township councillor um, to take you to fill your shoes when you, when you're retired? I think that's going to be a tough job. I mean, people are very intimidated when it comes to politics, especially young people. And I don't know if it's the voters who don't have enough confidence or feel that they, they know enough, but they have to learn, you know, you have to get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. And it's when, when I first went in there, I didn't know a whole lot either. Mm -hmm. So it's a learning curve. The more you're there, the more you pay attention, it's, it's easier for everyone. And there's a young lad, too, in South Glengarry, Trevor, and I can't remember his last name, and he's just uh, 20 years old as well. Very nice young man, very smart, and I've met with Mayor Duncan a few times. Very intelligent, politically minded man. So hopefully with those two role models, it'll be more inspiring for people, younger people, to be interested in politics. Ms. Claymore? Well, yes, I, I agree. I think, you know, I think we have to find different ways for engaging the public, including younger mm -hmm. public. Um, I'm finding that outside of election time, people are not as engaged with politics in general, mm -hmm. and they're not focusing on that. So we need to we need to find better ways to uh, to engage youth and the public in general. Mm -hmm. Ms. Taylor, well, just to build on what Bernadette is saying, I think that if you want to engage any demographic, don't just expect that to happen during the election. Um, mm -hmm. Youth don't have any exposure or a lot of exposure to. A politician till they want their vote and so I would challenge uh, you know people to get more involved uh, in our youth and in terms of mentoring uh, long before they want their vote and uh, that's a really great way to say you care beyond your election promise. I, I agree with all of the above and I would <laughs> throw this in as well there's something about the political structure the insecurity of a political career mm -hmm. that would deter most young people from making it their first choice because whether you're just out of high school, whether you're just out of university, you're probably, if, certainly if you're just out of university, you're deeply in debt. And you're not looking for a mm -hmm. temporary position anywhere. You have to find something that's going to give you a little bit of security, and then maybe you'll launch out into politics from that career. But when you're trying to establish a career, politics isn't and probably shouldn't be a person's first choice because you, uh, you work as a politician at the whim of the voter. Mm 
All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to, this will be our last round of, of question. I'm going to respond to what Ms. Taylor said before about subject and about media asking certain subjects of women rather than others. Mm -hmm. Most of the subject matter today was typical subject matter that, as you were describing. I'm going to ask you all to think for like 10 seconds, 15 seconds about a subject that you were never asked about and that you'd like to mention right now. It could be any subject politically that you never get to talk about, never asked a question by the media, and would always um, be happy to ask or be able to, to share on. And uh, I'm going to start with Councillor McDonald because the camera's pointed at you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you for the question. I'm trying to think of something about which I've not been asked. Mm. And uh, because I have to say, in the course of debates, running as a federal candidate, I think I was pretty well asked a question on every subject, That's true. including I was happy to have questions about international relations and international affairs. So I thought that was very good. Well, what do you think about the revolts recently in Egypt, Algeria, Libya, that situation? I have to say I'm excited about them, but I'm also very puzzled because I wonder what's fueling them. It seems uh, a little bit uh, of a stretch to think that it's all coincidental. And when you uh, are in countries where you have very strong regimes, you don't tend to get popular uprisings and to get, uh, you know, we're almost seeing um, you know, um, a domino effect. And uh, so I'm puzzled of, uh, just how much of these uh, uprisings are American engineered and financed and, uh, and what's well, behind them. You know, the food the pressures over there are much more impact, there's, there's a bigger impact on food pressures and economic pressures in, in countries over there than, say, compared to Canada. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you see the cost of bread over there jump up and the corruption, which is what triggered Algeria, allegedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if, if poverty was what led to uh, regime changes, uh, we'd see a lot more uh, rapid and <laughs> frequent regime changes. And speaking of, of food crises, we have them coming to North America, too. Mm -hmm. We read today's Globe and Mail, mm -hmm. there's uh, food mm -hmm. prices here are mm -hmm. going to be skyrocketing very soon. We've so, already noticed that. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm more puzzled about them right mm -hmm. now. I'm kind of waiting and seeing. Mm -hmm. Laurie, your turn. It was your question. Oh, I think I'm going to talk about a topic I only get to talk about when someone says, do you have anything else to add? And uh, that's what's always left off the political table, and that's poverty. And uh, particularly uh, the growing link between poverty and mental health. And mm -hmm. uh, as an educator, and you know, we talked, Natalie talked today about the pressures on healthcare. Well, they're downloaded more and more from the health system to the education system. And you know, the, the gap is growing. And uh, I, I think we're close to becoming, you know, when you talk about poverty being the root of a changing point, I think in our great democratic nation to have to have a tipping point for change is sad. And I hope that collectively we can 